and his name is Sandy Claus. Sing another note, and I walk. Start it up, big dog. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Filth. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield. Slime. And Big Anklevich. Putrescence. Meow. Woof. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 4, page 63. I am your first host, Rich Outfield. And I'm the second host, Big Anklevich. Did that hurt your feelings? <laughs> I am your half of your hosts, Rish Outfield. How's that? <laughs> That's fine. Not the better half. <laughs> Today, we have once again Michael Stone. The guy rocks. Now, he does. He rocks. This is what, his fourth appearance, I think, on our show? That's got to be a record. Um, yeah, so here he is again, and yeah, the guy rocks. Every time he says us something, we love it. Okay, we've heard him with Raising Archie. Oh, Archie! <laughs> um, that's all I can remember. Just Raising Archie is really all he's done. Clob. Oh, the... the Lonely the, the, Hearts Clob. And Japanese Motorcycle Clob. Uh, and so that was three stories, and this is number four. This is number four, yes. Excellent. Thank you for coming back again and again, Michael. You're like that poor abused housewife that just opens the door <laughs> wide again as soon as the blemishes and red marks are gone. Yeah. No matter how many reasons we give you to stay away next time, you still are back for more. And what is his story this week, Mr. Rish Outfield? Thank you, sir. Today's story is Like Cat and Dog. Michael Stone was born in 1966 in Stoke-on-Trent, England. Lovely. Since losing most of his eyesight, he has retreated from your world to travel the dark corners of inner space. Isn't that that Martin Short movie? I'm possessed! Yeah, that one. Or, to put it more prosaically, he thinks, what if? A lot. The signs are clear to those that know him well, for his one good eye glazes over, and he is rendered deaf to all English except for... Would you like a cup of tea, Mike? He will then engage in reality long enough to ask if there are any biscuits, before submerging again. He supposes this can be very trying for those around him, but he remains unrepentant. His vanity has a name www.myleftei.net That's right. Today's episode was produced by Brian Lincoln. Yes! He's I mean, back for more again as well. We'd like to thank L. Scribe Harris of the Pendragon Variety Podcast, Liz Lincoln, Brian Lincoln, Rebecca Lincoln, and John Lincoln for lending their voices to today's episode. Today's music is by Somewhere Off Jazz Street. Some sound effects were from the Free Sound Project, and you can check out the links in the show notes. Like Cat and Dog by Michael Stone Jade was coming on to Graham like a porn queen. Her seduction was just so artless, from the false yawn that displayed her canine extensions to the stretch that nearly toppled her breasts out of her low-cut dress. But so long as Graham was in on the joke, what harm could it do? Sophie cast a proprietary glance over the dimly lit bar and, seeing no one dying of thirst, settled for giving the counter a wipe with a beer towel. Kilworths tended to be quiet until much later in the evening, when most cats became active. She fought to suppress a giggle as Jade groaned in ecstasy and pressed her lips to Graham's ear. He pushed her away, tiring of the charade. Come on, lover boy. Let's raise the ante. Jade removed a brooch from her dress and pricked her thumb with the pin. A bead of blood trembled on her skin. Sophie's heart began to race. Plenty more where this came from, Jade said. If you'll make me your queen, pussy. Bitch! Graham hissed. His stool clattered to the floor as he stood. Sophie shouted, 
Graham, why don't... He wasn't listening. He spun out of Kilworth's elegant glass frontage in a whirl of leather and lace to be devoured by the night. Sophie watched him go with a mixture of envy and pride. Panthers did everything with style. They even ran away from girls with panache. She didn't know how and when Kilworth had become a place where mundane humans and cats rubbed shoulders, but she did know it was the promise of keeping company with her own kind that brought her here. That and eight quid an hour, plus tips, which wasn't bad for this side of the river. Unfortunately, having cats as clientele also brought in gawkers like Jade. Jade lit a cigarette and giggled. <laughs> Some guys don't know what they're missing. Sophie pitched her voice low. You're a regular here. Surely you know better than to do something that stupid. Obviously I don't. I thought you cats went crazy over a drop of blood. It's not a good kind of crazy, you... Stupid mundane. Sophie's annoyance increased as Jade tipped her head back and aimed a thin stream of smoke at the ceiling. Ahem. What now? She pointed to one of two signs hanging over the bar. Beneath the one that read, No Dogs Allowed, was one that forbade smoking. God, what is with you tonight? Jade sighed and ground the cigarette out. <sighs> Another bottle of red wine, please. Soph's my little kitten. Make it a Beaujolais. Sophie set down a full bottle in front of the girl, and then lifted the hinged portion of the counter. She walked through to pick up Graham's fallen stool. His glass lay on its side, the remnants of the grape juice soaking into the carpet. Non-alcoholic grape juice, because cats didn't have a head for the strong stuff. Jade tipped half a glass back and swallowed. A good-looking guy like Graham going to waste. It's criminal. She drained the glass in a titanic second gulp and poured another. Sophie mused that the only thing wasted around here was quality red wine. She had often considered ordering in cheap rubbish for Jade. The thing is, Jade, the lust for blood is like, oh, I don't know, sex and love. You can live without sex. Speak for yourself. But you can't live without love. Love is something much deeper, a vital energy that binds. It's a state of being. I'm probably not explaining this very well, but to us, the hunger for blood is as much spiritual as it is physical. There are medications, but they only go so far to suppress the physical longing. The rest is down to willpower. And then you come along and try to get Graham sampling your blood. She shook her head. <laughs> Would you blow smoke in the face of someone trying to quit the weed? Or off a recovering alcoholic, a whiskey? You were mocking him, Jade. We suffer the pain of abstinence so that we can dwell among you without fear of persecution. You just ask Graham to throw that away for... for nothing. Jade wriggled her hips and looked down at herself. I'd hardly call this nothing, Sophs. Sophie tried to relax her neck muscles. It had been three years and two months since she adopted her true form of a snow leopard and hunted down her own food. Over three years of constantly warring against her instincts, going domestic and shopping for carrion in supermarkets. It's a dangerous game you're playing, she said. So the predator has become the prey. Big deal. Graham was right. You really are a bitch. Sophie didn't need to make an excuse to leave Jade alone for a moment. An occasional visitor to Kilworth's named Owen, a large guy with a puckered scar that ran from his top lip up to his forehead, swaggered up to the bar and ordered a pint of warm milk pint sweetened, warm with milk honey. sweetened with honey. Sophie served him in silence, not speaking even as she took his money and returned his change. His eyes crinkled with amusement. Jade banged her empty glass on the counter and beckoned Sophie over. Hey, she whispered. What's that one? Lion? Cougar? Sophie hesitated before muttering, Timberwolf. A dog? What's he doing in here? Keep your voice down! Sophie's cheeks reddened with shame. He's provoking us. It'd take a determined lion to face down a Timberwolf the size of Owen, and he likes to rub our noses in it. 
and the arrogant bastard. One day. Sophie saw the gleam in Jade's eyes. Don't even think about it. Oh, come on. I'll bet he'll play with me. Stop it. Let him drink his milk and go. What's with the scar? Jade gestured clumsily at her face. It's a dueling scar. He's a pack leader. The Alpha? Jade slurred. A pack leader? Whoa! One or all bring him on! You can't possibly mean that. Oh no? Just watch me. Jade slid the bottle of wine along the bar. Hi, big guy. Where are all your friends tonight? Owen curled his fingers around the bottle and grinned, then stiffened. He raised a finger to his nose and sniffed, his mouth slightly open, his tongue pressed behind his incisors. Something tells me you'd better watch your step, young lady. He sloped away to a dark corner to nurse his milk. Condescending git. What's with everyone tonight? Sophie ground her teeth. For God's sake, Jade, take a hint. I'm telling you now, another peep out of you tonight and you're barred for life. Jade rolled her eyes and made an uncoordinated grab for the bottle. Sophie swept the bottle up and placed it down behind the counter. I think you've had enough. She frowned as something tacky on the label transferred itself to her palm. She brought it to her nose and smelt Jade's blood fresh. Sweet and heady. Just one taste. Where's the harm? She closed her eyes and touched the tip of her tongue to her hand. Juices flooded her mouth. A pounding heat started in her temples. It flowed down over her breasts and belly. She became aware of the sharpness of her teeth, the rending power in her jaws. She could pad over treacherous rocky slopes for mile after mile, day after day, without missing a beat. Tracking the prey, experiencing cold satisfaction in the kill, hot blood staining her muzzle, spraying over virgin snow. Gorging. Sophie surfaced from the racial memory. Her eyes fell on Owen. His yellow eyes bored through her stupor. Did he feel this way after tasting Jade's blood? A sardonic smile appeared on his lips. He rose from his seat and reached inside his leather greatcoat. Jade... Sophie raised the hinged portion of the counter. Jade, come through. What's wrong? Sophie grabbed Jade's hand and half dragged her through the counter, through the stockroom, and out the loading bay door. The night air wrapped frigid arms around them. Jade, listen to me. This is no time for questions. These are the keys to my car, a green Mondeo. It's in the next block. She hefted a steel dustbin full of refuse and sidled behind the door. Turn right at the end of the alley. Left, and then left again to Batter Sea Bridge Road. Now run! But Sophie, I can't see. It's too dark. Sophie swore. Bloody useless mundane senses. She swung the dustbin just as Owen's head appeared through the open door. He crashed to the ground with a curse. Bollocks. His body humped over as he began to adopt a more powerful shape. Sophie considered letting her body slide into her cat form. But to stand and fight a changed alpha wolf would be foolhardy. She heaved Jade over her shoulder and padded down the alleyway. She would never be able to show her face in this part of town again without getting it torn off. Males, whether cat or dog, would cut the females of either species a lot of slack, but braining a pack leader with a dustbin crossed all the boundaries of forgiveness and pissed on them for good measure. A howl rose behind them, traversed the streets, and soared above the rooftops. It was a sound so hardwired into the human psyche that all over the neighborhood, from Clapham to Lambeth, doors would be slammed and bolted against the night. Owen was calling his pack together. Sophie quickened her pace, not even slowing when they reached the well-lit carriageway. A busy thoroughfare would be no protection against Owen and his pack now. It didn't matter where they found her, they would take her down. Any passers-by would quickly move on or fade into the shadows. Three male dogs spilled out of a pub, less than a hundred yards away. Yellow eyes glowed from under bony foreheads. Sophie spun to see a female dog approaching from behind. Trapped. 
Owen leapt onto the road. He stretched his neck and howled again. Jade whimpered. Oh my god, I'm gonna... And was sick down Sophie's back. Sophie wrinkled her nose in disgust. That does it. She dropped her mantle of humanness. The skin on her palms and soles thickened into pads of hard leather. Claws hissed from her fingertips. Hair follicles all over her body sprouted dense white gold fur with dark rings. Muscle and tendon relaxed and flowed before hardening in compact knots. But supernature could not ignore the laws of physics. Sophie's mass could not be increased, only shifted and modified. Her strapless bra dropped around her waist. A snow leopard has no use for breasts. She tore away the soiled clothing and screwed shut her eyes. Oh, I hate this. Her eyeballs made a viscous pop as the pupil sprang into slits. Bit. She blinked rapidly to clear the noisome sensation. The change had taken only a few heartbeats, but that had been long enough for the five dogs to close in. Owen stood alongside the female. Made confident by their numbers and by the presence of their alpha, they hadn't changed. No doubt they were expecting her to drop Jade and surrender. Arrogant dogs. Sophie sprang at a male and, claws extended, slashed his head before bounding to a first-floor window ledge. She hissed at the scattered pack and held aloft a tattered scalp. Her victim lay motionless in a pool of blood. Adrenaline dissolved any regret she might have felt. Jade stuttered. Don't, don't drop! I won't. Sophie reassured her. The remaining two males and the female changed form. A siren sounded in the distance, growing louder by the second. Owen dispatched two Eurasian wolves to Sophie's left and a creamy-coated arctic to her right. Then he dropped to all fours and sniffed the inert body on the tarmac. He raised his muzzle and howled a long, forlorn note before turning a baleful yellow gaze on Sophie. You made a grave error, cat, he snarled. I wanted only the girl. In the window behind Sophie, drapes were pulled back. A sleepy mundane peered out. Sophie roared, and he fell back from the spittle-flecked pain. When she turned back to the street below, Owen had disappeared. Flashing blue lights bathed the walls. Jade, where did he go? I don't... Forget it, she snapped. Do you still have the car keys I gave you? Yeah, yeah. Good. Don't lose them. Sophie adjusted the blubbering mundane's weight on her shoulder and scaled the building exterior. Bounding from ledge to sill, she exploited her phenomenal balance and strength to reach the top of the four-story tenement in seconds. A series of rising and falling pitched roofs greeted her eyes. Dim light filtered up through skylights filmed with bird shed and moss. Why not let the police deal with it? Jade whimpered. And be taken down by a trigger-happy police marksman? No thanks. She spun at a clangor to her right, slid into shadow, ducked behind a small forest of aerials to let the angular shadows and stripes break up her outline. She let Jade slump to the rooftop. A dark, pelted wolf peered over the wall surrounding the rooftop. He had come up a fire escape. Jade whispered, What can you see? Sophie clamped a hand over her mouth and gave it a warning squeeze before letting go. She closed her eyes to slits. The wolf scanned the rooftop, then came over the wall. Another followed close behind, the two Eurasian males. Moving with infinite care, Sophie grasped a single-pronged aerial. It was fastened to a chimney, but the mortar was old and crumbly, and the corroded aluminum tubing came away with a single sharp tug. Brick and dust pattered to the tar paper roof. The lead wolf pricked his ears and sped straight towards her. Sophie straightened, raised an arm, and shouted, Fetch, boy! Ha! The dog hesitated for a split second, long enough for Sophie to step aside and lash it across the face with the metal rod. She followed up with a kick to the gut. Her claws raked soft belly skin, and the wolf dropped to its knees. Jade screamed, Watch out! Sophie dropped to her belly just as the second wolf launched itself at her. It landed on her back was unable to halt its momentum and slid off. Jaws snapped inches from her left foot. She pirouetted, flailed with the rod, and whacked the wolf across the muzzle. The pliable metal rod bent double. 
Leaving the creature blinded with agony, she turned on the first wolf and rammed the two ends of the bent aerial deep into its throat. Bright arterial blood bubbled and frothed over its chest. Sophie grabbed the second wolf by the scruff of the neck and the belt of its pants. Before it could gather its wits, she hoisted it above her head and staggered under its weight to the parapet. Please! It screeched. I yield. This isn't a competition, mutt! Below, a policeman was attempting to hold back a crowd gathered around the dog she'd scalped. It was you or me. We both know that. Sophie grunted and heaved the frantic dog to the street. It padded uselessly in the air before landing headfirst on the road with a muffled, pulpy splat. Onlookers screamed and fell back. Sophie ducked away before anyone looked up and regarded with distaste the specks of blood marring the fine white fur of her chest and belly. Unlike a prey animal's blood, which ignited fireworks on the tongue, the blood of a fellow predator smelled and tasted rancid. She stepped over the fast-expiring, wheezing dog on the ground and stared at the spot where she'd left the girl. Jade, where are you? A muffled cry came from the other end of the roof. Sophie sprinted across the tar paper and slates just in time to see Jade being dragged through a door leading onto an unlit staircase. She glimpsed a creamy white pelt. Leave her, or I'll kill you. The female arctic wolf stood on the lower landing, one hand around Jade's wrist, the other clamping her mouth. The girl's eyes bulged with terror. Sophie flicked casually at the bloodstains on her pelt. Not mine, she said, and peeled back her lips in a savage grin. Owen said the girl had to be brought to him. You want her? You come and get her. Sophie scanned the narrow concrete staircase less than two yards wide. She leapt, but halfway down changed her angle of descent by springing off the wall to her right, then the left, right, left, right, zigzagging like a rubber ball. The confused wolf shoved Jade away and raised its hands to defend itself. Sophie landed squarely on the wolf's shoulders and bore it down under her weight. She bit hard on its neck and then wriggled her jaws to work her canines over the back of the skull. The wolf yelped and flattened its ears. I yield. Sophie considered her options. She could spare this creature, convince her to mislead Owen into believing Sophie and Jade had escaped, but that relied on trust. A cat trust a dog. The wolf squirmed and looked at Jade. Run, girl, she's... Sophie bit down, her canines punching through skin and bone. Crack! The wolf jerked once, then lay still. Sophie rocked back onto her haunches and ran her tongue over the clean fur of her upper arms to get rid of the taste of the wolf's cerebral fluid. Jade collapsed on the steps and buried her face in her hands. Sophie shook her by the shoulders. Hey, come on. You've got to hold it together for me, you hear? Jade looked up, her face a mess of running mascara and smudged lip gloss. I can't... I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to go down to the police. Owen won't dare. And what about me? I just wiped out four members of his pack. Do you think he's going to let me walk away from this? He's likely calling for reinforcements right now. You have to help me, Jade. I saved your life several times over tonight. You owe me. I'll go and kill Worth and tell your cat friends. They'll help. Cats help! Sophie laughed bitterly. <laughs> We're not known for our spirit of cooperation. Jade shrugged helplessly. Then what can I do? Sophie allowed herself a small smile of satisfaction. You still have my car keys? The girl opened her clenched fist to reveal a set of bloodied keys. She had gripped them so tightly they'd cut her palm. The sweet scent rose like smoke, filling Sophie's muzzle with aromatic temptation. Why is he coming after me anyway? Jade asked plaintively. I never did anything to harm him. He's blood crazy. He... he's tasted you. Sophie shook her head and stretched her eyes like a drunk trying to focus. Imagine heroin to a junkie, only ten times stronger. I never realized it was so bad. Yeah, well, it's a bit late for regrets. Look, go down to the next block, Battersea Bridge Road, and find my car. The dark green Ford, remember? 
The cops will be swarming all over the place, rounding up any stray cats and dogs. You'll be quite safe. Get in and start the engine. Then what? Good question. Sophie muttered to herself. How had she let herself get into this situation? Damn animal instincts. What? Nothing. Wait for two minutes, then bring the car round to the entrance at the bottom of these stairs. Got that? Wait two minutes. Jade stood and swayed. Sophie reached out to steady her. I knew I shouldn't have served you that wine. Are you up to this? The girl swept stray hair off her face and nodded. I'm counting on you, Jade. I know. She took a deep breath. I won't let you down, Sophie. Sophie watched her feel her way down the unlit stairs and open a door onto a carpeted hallway. Light blazed briefly, then dimmed as the door closed behind her. With Jade gone, she turned the dog corpse over and unzipped its voluminous quilted jacket. The collar had a gruesome stain, but that didn't matter. She slipped the jacket on and huddled down in the corner of the landing. When she stood again, it was in human form. Moonlight shining through the open doorway silvered the steps. Her senses were still better than those of a mundane, but even so they paled into insignificance compared to what she enjoyed in her leopard form. The night lacked texture and depth. She trotted up the steps, out onto the roof, and headed for the parapet overlooking the road. Down below, two cops strode along the pavement. They carried sidearms and looked jumpy with them. The click of high heels preceded Jade's appearance. Sophie swore under her breath when one of the cops interrupted his patrol to approach her. Are you okay, miss? I'm uh, fine, thank you. You don't look it, if you'll forgive me for saying so. I, I've had a bad night. Did you see those poor men on the street back there? Spare your tears, miss. They were only dogs. They were changed men, officer. Of course, changed men. Um, we're looking for a young woman named Jade Golightly. Caucasian, mid-twenties, long black hair, last seen wearing a low-cut black dress. He looked at her, expectantly. I haven't seen anyone fitting that description tonight, officer. I hope you find her. Would you walk me to my car? Sophie grinned. Whoever would have thought Jade could be so resourceful under pressure. A deep voice rumbled behind her. You've brought down a shitstorm, cat. She turned slowly. Owen towered over her, six foot six of packed muscle draped in a dense gray pelt. The white scar on his brow glowed in the moonlight. He moved between her and the door to the stairs. Shit. Where's the girl? He asked. Back down on the street. You gave her up? Not exactly. When Sophie didn't elaborate, he asked, Do you realize what you've done for the sake of one girl? Sophie folded her arms across her chest and shrugged. She whetted my appetite. Does she realize? That I've abducted her? No, she thinks I rescued her from you. It's a facet of prey animals, you see. Docile stupidity. For years we've lobbied for equal rights and freedom of movement. We leave the mundanes alone, and they leave us alone. You've jeopardized all that! Surely you felt it too, Owen, when you tasted her blood on your tongue? The feeling that you're living a lie. We are not domestic animals to be watched and mocked like some 21st century freak show. Especially by the likes of Jade. Oh, Graham, make me your queen pussy. He should have ripped her face off. So you'd rather we return to the Dark Ages, when the changed were driven from their homes and hunted to near extinction. We are legally protected now, and... No, I don't want to return to the Dark Ages, but nor do I want to be a tame exhibit in a zoo. She heard a car door slam, and seconds later, the quiet purr of an engine. She had two minutes to get down there. So, dog, what are you going to do with me? Carry me off and bury me alongside your squeaky toy and water bowl? Owen smiled slyly and reached inside his leather greatcoat. 
Sophie recalled seeing him perform the same action in the bar, just before she'd taken Jade. She backed off. The rough coping stones of the parapet jutted into the small of her back. He pulled out a wallet and flipped it open to reveal a silver badge. You're under arrest. What? Don't think for one second I'd rather not rip your throat out. Like I did with one of your precious pack? I crunched through the female's skull. Hope you didn't have the hots for her. Was she your mate? Did you hump behind the dustbins and howl at the moon or chase cars together? That's what you dogs do, isn't it? Owen's breathing came short and choppy. Specks of foam mottled his lower lip. We are wolves, cat. Yeah, the big bad wolf who came strutting into Kilworths every so often to scare us little pussycats. You're a dog, Owen. A wolf tamed and domesticated. She sneered at the police badge shining in the moonlight. And you're terrified the hand of the master might turn against you. Well, as much as I'd like to stay and go to you all night long. She climbed onto the parapet, cupped her hands to the side of her mouth, and screamed. Ah! Owen dashed forward. What are you doing? Help me! She yelled. The wolfman's trying to eat me! Sophie launched herself backwards as if pushed. She saw Owen's anger turn to shock, frozen in time with his hand reaching for her. The cold air whistling past her ears raised the hair on her hackles. Muscles reconfigured, and her bones snapped into a feline posture. Sophie's spine started to twist. Without volition, her shoulders rotated, and her hips swiveled to bring her around to land four square. She didn't have the time to properly brace herself. The impact slammed her body full <sighs> length into the tarmac. Her chin hit the ground, and for a long second, she hovered on the edge of unconsciousness. Her pupils sprang into slits with a revolting pop, marking the completion of her transformation. Jeez! She groaned. One of the cops pulled his sidearm and aimed at the rooftop. High above, Owen oh, raged incoherently. Bloody cat! A hand touched Sophie's wrist. A concerned policeman's voice by her ear said, Don't move! An ambulance is on the way! He gasped. You're a... She rolled over. Correct. <clears throat> and head-butted him senseless. Jade tugged Sophie, it around. Come on. The world tilted crazily as Sophie got to her feet and staggered to her waiting car. Jade threw open the driver's door and shuffled over to the passenger seat. Sophie slid into human form, dropped gratefully behind the wheel, and gunned the engine. She checked her mirror to see Owen drop into the road. He rose and came after her. Bullets zinged off the tarmac as confused police officers continued to fire on him. Yellow sparks burned briefly like incandescent fireflies. For a moment, he was gaining ground on the car. Then he stiffened suddenly, clutched his thigh, and began to limp. He threw his head back and began a pain-ridden howling. A police marksman's bullet ended it. Sophie quick shifted through the gears. The lights of the city streaked across the windscreen as they sped across the Thames. She darted a glance at the girl in the passenger seat. It's been a wild night. I think it's best if you come home with me. Jade was wide-eyed and trembling. I'm just... so cold. We'll soon get you warmed up. Then I'll fix us some dinner. I thought a nice steak Diane would go down well. Jade frowned. But that's got red wine in it, and you hate alcohol. Sophie engaged the central locking system. She took a hand off the wheel and squeezed one of Jade's beautiful, plump thighs. Saliva filled her mouth. She had to swallow before she could answer. That's okay. All the alcohol is burned out of the meat if you cook it thoroughly. Author's Note My name is Heather and my dad is the author of Like Cat and Dog. Hope you all enjoyed it. Dad says I'm not old enough to listen to it yet. I'll have to take your word for whether it's any good or not. It's no good looking at me like that. You don't listen to it and that's that. Just get on with the interview, come on. <laughs> right, Dad, tell the listeners how the story came about. 
Well, the punchline came from Hundred Word Story I wrote for Fusing Horizons in 2003. A couple of years after that, the story grew into a weird cat story, No Dogs Allowed, which was published in an anthology called Twisted Cat Tales. And then in 2007, it grew again to become this story, Like Cat and Dog, which was published in the Beast Within anthology from Graveside Tales. Well, it all ends. Good question. You would say that, you asked me to say it. Shh, just ask the questions like I told you to. So, where will it end? Oh, Good question. Mm. I'm currently working on a novel-length mystery that features Sophie. She's tracking down a mysterious rogue man that preys on the gifted called the Skinny. OK, I think we've covered everything. Can we listen to the story now? No. Bloody kids. OK, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> I'm still laughing. <laughs> they need to have their own podcast. I think so, yeah. The Stones Age. <laughs> I'm surprised you're not in marketing. Or Dude. anything, for that matter. That's true. I just stay here. <laughs> the uh, author's note may have been more entertaining than the story. <laughs> yeah, it was good stuff. Uh, and, and yeah, the fact that I can understand her, but not a word, <laughs> he says... <laughs> Oh, you're taking the piss out of his accent again? See, that's the thing is you and I think that we do all right English accents, but th- if that's an English accent, then obviously that's well we do not. beyond us. Yeah. <laughs> well, regardless of the language barrier, I'm a big fan of Michael Stone. And, yeah, uh, me too. This is uh, another really, really good story. And the fact that he's got another one, a sequel or a, a novel. A, 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 a but that's, that's right. all, folks. That's really promising. <laughs> I mean, who knows if Sophie, the werecat, where jaguar, where leopard, where the hell are we going with this? I don't know. If she'll make an, a return appearance. Perhaps we might be able to uh, talk Michael into uh, sending us out the Skinner. How did he say it? This yeah, see, I one. thought... That it was skinny, but it's skinner. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> they invented the language. I guess they get to say it. Yeah, they, they can like. say whatever they want. We just have to deal with it. Uh, maybe we can talk them into sending that our way. But let's mock him a little bit longer yeah. before we ask. That'll uh, definitely make him feel like sending us more. Speaking of Sophie, the, uh, the last, dare I say, that <laughs> did the voice for Sophie. I don't, uh-huh. I'm not familiar with her. Is somebody Brian knew? I think so, yeah. Her name is uh, L. Stein Markowitz. What, uh, no, no, seriously, what is her name? Her name was L. Scribe Harris of the Pendragon yes, okay. Variety Stop. Podcast. It, just say you don't know. Don't don't make don't up. Make one up. Yeah, Scribe, that's an interesting nickname. It's in quotation marks, so it's not actually her real name. That's, I think, what you do when you're giving somebody a nickname is you put quotes around it. Thank you, sir. Our next English <laughs> lesson will be from Michael's daughter. But yeah, she was pretty good, huh? I really enjoyed her performance. She did a great job. And from what I understand, she's not, in fact, English. But she sounded more English than that Timberwolf guy did, I'll tell you that much. Is that Brian? No, that was me. I don't know if she and Brian are on good terms, but if Michael does send us that sequel, maybe we can ask her to, uh, whoop, there you go, sorry, ask her to do the voice on that as well. Yeah, that would be awesome. Or am I counting my Chia pets before they hatch here? You might be. We'll have to see. I mean, keep talking about Mike's accent and you may find that he's finally had enough. All right. So that brings us to the end of our show. (laughs) Good night, everybody. Oh, wait. We used that joke already before. And we will again. (laughs) It's funny. We've done a few episodes in the past in which we've discussed cats and discussed Uh. dogs and discussed how disgusted we are with cats and how much we enjoy dogs. I think we have to hit on that just a little bit further today. You know, there, there's no better time than a story like this. Well, it's ironic. Wait, I never understand what irony means. Damn you, Alanis Morissette. And we've done that joke as well. <laughs> it's ironic. Everybody, you didn't even need to listen today. You could just have replayed some old episodes and have gotten all our content for today. Welcome to the June Steve Greatest Hits. Hope you have a good Independence Day weekend. <laughs> you might think this is one of those uh, clip show episodes. <laughs> we should just be tossing. Oh, remember when 080T said that you were a douche? Oh, yeah. Let's play that clip. I remember when we thought Announcer Man was going to die. Uh, huh? I do, 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 do. can't believe Announcer <laughs> Man is going to die. You, sir, are worse than Hitler. It is ironic. 
that we should do this story tonight because we didn't get started until late. Tell the listener why. <laughs> well, we walked in the door. We were and just setting up the mics. foulest stench was in the air. <laughs> we were just setting up the mics. And my daughter comes up and I'm like, hey, get back in bed. Because it was already late, like we said. But, you know, she came up to tell me of something. Are you going somewhere with this, guys? She came up to tell me that the cat had puked all over the carpet downstairs just outside the door to her room. And I said, uh-huh, great. Then I sent her back to bed and then my wife heard her and then she came back in and she says, Mommy told me to ask you if you can clean it up. <laughs> so now I got to go downstairs and take care of the mess. He also cleaned up the vomit. <laughs> nice one. And maybe just cats do this. I don't know if that's just a cat trait because cats are known for hacking up fur balls or whatever. You know, that's a pretty common thing that cats do. So maybe the vomiting is part of that. But our cat vomits a lot, man. Just puking all the time. Drives me crazy. We finally had to come up with a rule in our house. <laughs> Whoever finds the puke gets to clean it up. And yet... It doesn't always work out, yeah. Nobody wants to do it. So what winds up happening is they find the puke and then they look the other way and pretend they never saw it until either until I or my wife uh, find it and then we have to clean it up because we're the ones that will actually do it. That's not true. I have to clean it up because I'm the one that will actually do it, which really pisses me off mm -hmm. because I don't like cats. I don't appreciate this cat in any way. The cat hates me. Doesn't listen to the podcast. Yeah, and yet somehow I'm the one that's got to clean up the friggin' puke. Not fun. But I know we've got a lot of cat lovers that uh, sometime listen to the podcast, although those people may have already skipped to the end of this show. But if you're a cat lover, if you have any idea why my cat might be puking all the time, Give me some advice in the comments, because I'm sick and tired of cleaning this crap up. You know, it's a little bit funny, this feeling inside. <laughs> no. I'm not one of those who can oh. easily hide. Please. Don't got much money, but no more singing, Rish, for the love of Luke Coddington. Uh, yesterday, I was driving to Walmart, and uh, in the parking lot, they had... Uh, Human sacrifice. No, in the parking lot, there wow. was a, a little girl and she had a cardboard box and a sign. Uh, as I drove past, she, she raised the sign and uh, shook it at me. So I slowed down to see what the sign is because, you know, it could have been the blood test came back and you are my dad. I don't know. And she was giving away kittens. The cardboard box was filled with uh -huh. baby okay. cats. Okay. And apparently they start as kittens. Oh. And when do they become... Okay, F it. So anyhow... <laughs> The, I'm sorry, this was supposed to be a short episode, but it takes me this long to even get out to the <laughs> punchline. Oh, sorry. R -O -T. Just have him bleep that, please. Okay. So I slowed down. She was giving away these kittens, but on the sign it said, we'll give $5 per kitten to take them off my hands or something like that. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, that's really desperate, sad, heartwarming. That <laughs> proves how loved cats are, I think. Well, you can't give them away anymore. You have to pay people to take them away. I couldn't even really imagine that because, well, can you not just drop them off at the pound? Yeah, that's what I was like thinking. That? Is it not free to get rid of a cat at a pound if you had to? But maybe she was thinking that this is a way to screen potential owners, the people, you know, to see if How does that screen them? Because she'll say, oh, I'm sorry, no, uh, not you, f*** off. <laughs> you know, if, if some guy's like, I would like kitties. <laughs> and he's slobbering and he's got an erection. Warning, <laughs> today's episode <laughs> contained comments from Rish Outfield. Listener discretion oh, but, is advised. But, I mean, can't you do that same stuff giving them away for free without paying them five bucks? I mean, isn't... Offering someone five bucks only going to make it more likely that you're going to get some piece of crap that's going to take that cat and then tie it up in a bag and throw it in the river as soon as it gets around the corner. So yeah, I just made five bucks. <laughs> I mean, you know. Where were you yesterday? <laughs> I just pitied the girl and drove on. Or actually, I just honked and laughed and swerved in her direction. I just, I, I'm a bad person. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> it, you didn't uh, consider the chance to get five <laughs> bucks though, huh? I don't know. I, I, the way that they used to always do it in the cartoons is that you'd put them in a burlap sack. and Right. Put a rock in the sack with them and toss them in the river and that's it for that.
when I was in South America, as we previously uh, referred to, dude... I used to come across on the street here or there or wherever, there would just be kittens. And these were like brand new kittens, hadn't opened their eyes type kittens. Ones that can't even really walk yet. And they're just left here or there on the street. And I don't know if these were the kittens of stray cats, where they came from. But I swear, it, it was like a different mentality down there, you know. If you didn't want a kitten, you'd still do that. you put them in the burlap sack, tie it to a rock, and toss it in the river, and your problems are solved. But, Is yeah, that- you know, just over this weekend, I saw a story on the news about somebody who had pitched some little kittens in a dumpster. And, you know, the police are trying to figure out who did this so they can bring up, like, animal cruelty charges on these people but, for well, doing they, that. They didn't kill the cats. No, they, they didn't. They just They put them in a them. dumpster. Now, I I hate cats, as you know, (laughs) but it seems like that's much better than drowning them or stomping them or whatever it is. I mean, can't they eat in the dumpster and continue to breathe? And on the Tom and Jerry cartoons, there was always a cat in the dumpster, right? I mean, isn't that then maybe that was where they were born? Well, yeah. I I mean, Tom and Jerry cartoons are a good reflection on reality, right? I do often see mice mutilating cats with mallets (laughs) and hypodermic needles, but. So it's illegal to kill a cat? No, I don't think it's illegal. It may depend on what state you live in and stuff like that. I think you're allowed to euthanize your cat or dog or whatever as long as it's done in a certain way. Like, I think you can shoot an animal. But you can't leave it alive in a dumpster? (laughs) But you're only allowed to shoot it once or something. It has to die with the first shot. You can't be a poor shot and have to give it a second shot or else now you're cruel. Yeah, it's still just kind of left over from older times or like farmers still need these kind of things so they can take care of their livestock or I don't know where these laws come from. But yeah, there's some strange laws out there as far as that goes that are still around. I think you're still allowed to burn witches as well. So as long as she's turned you into a newt. (laughs) I got better. Well, okay. What are the laws in England about why am I asking you? <laughs> I was going to ask you the same question. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's it's, it's kind of strange. I wouldn't do that. Uh, we've got an infrastructure set up around here. They it's have called that. the Spam Factory. I don't know if they have that in uh, South America where they can just go to a pound and say, hey, you know, i got these cats that I don't want. Okay, so this guy who freed his cats into a, a dumpster. <laughs> now, I don't care. Paint me a bad guy here. I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh huh. Because well, okay, maybe they can't get out, and they will. Yeah, I don't. I, they I, will be eaten by rats in that dumpster. Yeah. I don't know. To tell but, you the truth, I didn't read the whole story. I just basically saw the headline that somebody was dumped cats in a dumpster. So they may well have zipped them up in a Ziploc bag and stuck them in. I don't know. You know, oh, they, okay, they, it could have been something cruel. I don't know what happened exactly. I didn't pay enough attention. Yeah, that's kind of my whole life. So I'm probably digging myself in deeper. By questioning this. Should we move on? I think also these cats were too small to take care of themselves. So dumping them in the dumpster is basically killing them. And that's probably the problem. Yeah, I mean, like I was saying, I I wouldn't do that because you don't need to. You can drive to the pound and turn them in there and they'll try and adopt them out. Or if they can't, then they'll euthanize them in some humane way. Now, if you got a mogwai wet (laughs) and you had a cardboard box full of new mogwai... Can you put those in a dumpster? What is this? Uh, Whereas just leaving them out in the sun, that would be cruel, right? Richard, um, idiot. I think what the law says you're supposed to do about that is you should microwave each one of them one at a time <laughs> until they explode. Okay. That's the humane way to take care of those, yeah. Don't you guys have anything interesting <laughs> to right. talk about? Well, I Wait, 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 wait! I've probably pissed off a lot of people in previous episodes, so this is nothing new. <laughs> but still, this is, I think, the third episode I've complained that creative people like cats and non-creative garbage like us, like (laughs) dogs. This story was much more pro-cat, I would say, than dog. Don't you think? Well, pro where cat than where dog, I would say. The where cat was the main character, but... But she was a dirty, you, dirty bitch, wasn't she? Okay, hey, can we use the word bitch when referencing when you're referring to cats? Where no, cat? Only when you're referring to where dogs. What is a female cat called? I have no idea. Do they have a special name? A <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my lord, the profanity in this episode. <laughs> uh, see, that's not an offensive word to Michael Stone or his daughter, sadly enough. Oh boy. Um, 
films. <laughs> Please stop me before I kill again. <laughs> every no. time that a policeman comes into a crime scene and it says, stop me before I kill again on the wall in like human blood. I just, that, it's not amusing at all, is it? <laughs> Ooh, well, I cleared the palette with that. <clears throat> we, we just floated down off of the ceiling like that scene in Mary Poppins when they bring up the uh, not so funny stuff. So our English accents, better or worse than Dick Van Dyke's in Mary Poppins? Terrible. I, I think somebody has told me my English accent is okay, but my Scottish accent is worse than Dick Van Dyke's English accent. Mm. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> yeah, this story, I don't think you could say it's pro-cat. Sure, the cat was the main character, but she was revealed to be the uh, bad one in the end. She's tricking this poor, awful <laughs> girl that she's taking away into uh, becoming her dinner. And she's killed all these were dogs who are good. They're good dogs. Aren't they all? So, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's pro-cat. I think it reveals the true nature of all cats. Evil, would it be? Yes, yes. Ah. Evil, self-interested, and all they want to do is eat. That's the only time my cat ever comes near me is when it's expecting me to feed it. And it's like rubbing on my leg. Oh, I love you. Look, my bowl's empty. Otherwise... Now, did your wife teach it this? <laughs> <laughs> you all right? I learned it by watching you. <laughs> Sorry. She doesn't listen to this podcast, does she? No, she doesn't, luckily. Uh, I've, I've said before, probably not on the air, but of all the monsters in literature or, or universal horror movies, the werewolf is my favorite. Oh, yeah? And I always wanted to do a werewolf story on the air. This is... Got to be the closest we've come. Yeah, well, that's a wolf pack. I mean, I play a timber wolf slash man, so I don't think you could call me anything but a werewolf. So yeah, we did a werewolf douche. story. We made it. Oh, well, that goes without saying. But Okay, so you think technically, let's say that we had a checklist and it had zombie, vampire, serial killer, alien, Hillary Clinton, werewolf, sea monster on it. We could check off werewolf because of this story yeah i think so okay well yeah this isn't like love bites where you thought it was about vampires but in the end it was not really about vampires this was actually a werewolf involved in this and a were leopard lots of were beasties yes okay. oh you remember how i was telling you the uh, uh testing center diarrhea story the other day i'm just gonna stay it right here on the air if we get two donations in the next week I will tell the testing center diarrhea story. However, if that repulses you, if we get three or more donations, I will not tell the testing center diarrhea story. Now. All right. Does so, that sound fair? So there you go. I guess we'll just find out what happens next week on a very special episode of Blossom. Cool. I was waiting for you to go somewhere with the werewolf thing. I don't... No? Not going anywhere? I think so. I mean, we can. I traditionally imagine werewolf stories to be different so you, than this. So you but... only count it a werewolf story if the werewolf is an evil monster that's, like, going to eat people or whatever. In this case, you, you don't consider this a werewolf? I guess in my mind it's not. But, you know, like, people consider 28 Days Later to be a zombie movie. Uh -huh. But all those people are just infected with a disease. Uh, it's just somewhere somebody said that's what a zombie is. And so, you know, I don't know. I'm, I, I would say technically this is not a werewolf story because, if anything, it's a were-cat and were-dog story. Maybe I'm being too picky. I think you might but, be. But just like the, the curse of the werewolf, the, the traditional oh, right, right. Kurt Siodmak werewolf mythology is, you know, you're bitten by a werewolf and you become a werewolf when there's the full when moon. When the full moon, right. And, and these, aren't, these are shape-shifting type werewolves, right? Right. But you'll see the movies like Underworld where they can change at will. And those are still werewolves. Uh-huh. But I don't know. I must be being a, a stickler here and I shouldn't be. That's okay. That's what keeps monsters of these types coming back again is that people reimagine them in other ways in interesting ways so yes you could say that the moon needs to be incorporated in there somehow to make it a werewolf i don't know well, hey you're a big fan of the twilight saga oh yes is jacob <laughs> a werewolf i mean is there the moon is there silver bullets is there there is none of that stuff is involved in that 
apparently there are moon silver bullet type werewolves out there in that universe and these guys aren't involved in that whole thing they these are the shapeshifter kind yeah they start calling them shapeshifters at one point or another in the, in those books so the things you do for a woman or would do for a woman in my case ladies <laughs> sorry you wouldn't read twilight for a woman admit it you could never be intimate with a woman that loves Twilight. That's true. I read Twilight for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we still recording? That is pretty. <clears throat> and you didn't do it. it for me. You just did it because everybody was reading it and you figured you had to give it a shot. It was the Harry Potter. You take that back, sir. It was Harry, Harry Potter and Twilight should not be in the same it was sentence. The Harry Potter thing that everybody's reading it, so you at least had to check it out and see if it was for you or not. That's probably true. I think there was a point here, but <laughs> you we drove past werewolves. it so fast that there were two exits down now. Just to go back and find where we were, it would take us an hour out of our way. I liked this story. I like the shapeshifter kind of things. Uh -huh. Abby Hilton likes to talk about the half fox, half weasel, half person, things like that. Or they all have names, but kind of, they're they're always like that. They're, yeah, those are very different things. Those are like your fawn from the uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe stuff. You know, Mr. Tumnus, where they're just half, they're, they're, they're pan. You are. Or they're satyrs, like Phil from uh, Hercules. Yeah, those are a little different. They're always that way. But, you know, when I was younger, I used to read Piers Anthony a lot for some reason. I think it, he really plays well with teenage boys for some reason. Maybe <laughs> not like that. Come on. He uh, caters to the uh, the things that teenage boys seem to think are cool. And uh, one of those things that I think really tells you about that is that every character if she's female she is described as buxom oh i learned what that word meant by reading this guy's books but anyways in one of these series that i read there were all these shapeshifter type characters unicorns also had human forms and some of them had a third form that they could turn into like a hummingbird or whatever Go. Well, that doesn't even make any sense a unicorn and a hummingbird aren't the same size well, well, it was kind of a magic-based thing, so size didn't matter in that world. It shouldn't in this one either, folks. So it was kind of like that, and they had people that they called werewolves in this book, and they were men that turned into wolves, but they could just change form and then change back. I guess I was already prepared from a young age to be ready for this Michael Stone story and enjoy it and like the way the werewolves are already. Didn't go against any uh, preconceived notion that I had for werewolves. Yeah, I don't know. But, but just... vampires don't sparkle. That's wh true. Whether you've read Piers Anthony or not. I just needed to get that out there. It doesn't have anything <laughs> to do with our conversation. <laughs> it's interesting, man. Michael Stone, he can just get me every time. And whatever it is that he's got, every story he sends our way, it just, it's just like a home run. It scores big. It hits it out of the park every time. More baseball metaphors, please. <laughs> it swings for the fences. It... Rarely bunts, ladies and gentlemen. It's, <laughs> it's on deck. Oh, wait. Well, it sounds like he's got more stories in this universe as well. So who knows? We could have two parallel Michael Stone series going. Yeah, that would be awesome. We just need to get Michael Stone working on Club Part 3. We're so bad. The Babysitter's too. Club. Ew. <laughs> and don't forget, I'm going for a smoke break. This should be the last podcast of May, shouldn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. Or at the very least, it's going to hit before June 7th. 7th. So, yeah, this is your last reminder. The Broken Mirror story event is on. The idea is you write a story based on the following premise. A child is proclaimed king. Or queen. But it turns out to be more than just a game. So if you can write a story based on that, you have until June 7th to get that story written and sent in to us. You just toss it into our submissions with the uh, heading BMSE or Broken Mirror or Broken Mirror Story Event or whatever. And yeah, that will uh, get sent on to our readers and judged. Okay, and, so get to work on that. Yeah. Eh, whatever you say, guys. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, I guess that uh, brings us to the end of our show today, huh? I think so. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Brian, for pulling our fat out of the fire. 
Is that correct? Oh, is that a phrase? You're not as fat as you were, but I'm still very fat, so okay. hey. No, is that not a phrase? I don't know, is it? I mean, baby fish mouth is sweeping the nation. <laughs> oh, speaking of Brian Lincoln, producer of today's show, we did an interview with him like just a few weeks ago. It's just now coming up on his podcast. He does the the full cast podcast. It's a podcast for people who are interested in doing a show uh, like similar to ours where you involve a full cast in doing the story instead of just a one person narrating the thing. And yeah, it's just kind of to help people understand and learn how to overcome the challenges that are going to be involved in that. And so, yeah, he interviewed us, him and Abigail Hilton, who is the uh, other host of the show. And they interviewed us about what we've learned from doing our show. So if you're interested in hearing that uh, interview, you can head over to fullcastpodcast.com and, and have a listen to it. And I guess it's a two-part interview as well, so half of the interview is uh, ready to go now. You can listen to now, and the other half uh, will be up soon. Yeah, good stuff. It's worth listening to. We tried to make it entertaining. I think those guys uh, work pretty hard to get new guests in and to prepare topics that they anticipate people might want to know about. And yeah. then they also answer questions, I believe, yeah. from And they uh, might listeners. find uh, it informative. So check it out. That brings us to the end of the show. Well, that's our show. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. And I'm wearing milk bone underwear. See you later, folks. Ciao. Thanks for listening. At the Dune Steef, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. You want to know how pathetic I was? I am. Okay, tell me. When we ran Love Bites and we talked about, ooh, vampire, almost vampire. Ooh, ooh, we need a vampire story. Uh -huh. I started writing a vampire story. Yeah? And just finished it last week. It's taken me that bloody long. <laughs> well. Oh, the laziest sack of crap. Oh, I'm so, we're still recording. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, please donate to the podcast. <laughs> Jade gestured. Jade gestured. Jade gestured. 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 Jade gestured. Jade gestured. <laughs> Jade gestured. Clums. One more time. Okay, Jade. hold on gestured what was i saying i don't know it's gone to something really kind of strange after yes. saying it like a hundred times but you sound like casey casey jade gestured jade gestured jade gestured a new gestured. band on the countdown this week is jade gestured with their first number one hit clumsily at her face the lead singer of the Cars is a ghastly-looking man. <laughs> but somehow he's married to Paulina Puriskova. I don't get it myself. How much did the devil collect for that deal? He obviously got a better deal than I did with my wife, Jean. She hasn't been seen since Ghostbusters. Uh, what are we on? <laughs> Jade gesture. Jade gesture. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that ain't funny, man. Jean Kasem is my grandmother. <laughs> you always mock me for knowing who Hume Cronin is, but Jean Kasem is way more obscure. That's than... true, I guess. <laughs> Prince tonight. Owen curled his fingers around the bottle and grinned, then stiffened. Ooh, wait a minute. I didn't know it was that kind of a story. I'm sure, like, his hackled stiffened or whatever, dude. <laughs> Bitch. Dogs barking in the background. They heard me growl. I think they even... I like the one you did the, the three years ago. All right, good. I'm going to let these dogs keep barking. stop barking. It's quite sort of fitting for the story. But I don't. With, with dogs in the background. 
bitch. Like I summoned them. She swung the dustbin just as Owen's head appeared through the open door. He crashed to the ground with a curse. Oh, rasa frassin. <laughs> Say bollocks. Uh, okay. Oh, bollocks. It's a facet of prey animals, you see. Docile stupidity. Sorry. Surely you felt it too, Owen. Fool. You need to get ooh into that. Well, that's another British word. Why have you ever said foolhardy? It sounds like you're saying full hardy. When your brother has to listen to all this shit. Bitch. That was to you, not to the microphone. I know, it okay. was to me. Thank you. And Jade whimpered. Oh my god, I'm gonna... And was sick down Sophie's back. Make the noise. Wait, wait. Hey, hey. hey, he can't use any of that. It's Sophie. <laughs> I just wanted to see I how mean, long I could make it go on. It's too true. bad I can't see his face as he listens to it, because I'd like to see if he has to turn it off. I wonder who that one dude was who said he like couldn't even stand to listen to the sound of water being poured into a cup. Because it reminded him of peeing. I don't remember what it was. It reminded him of taking a slash. <laughs> a snow leopard has no use for breasts. Just like Neil Patrick Harris. Sophie grabbed the second wolf by the scruff of the neck and the belt of his pants. Huh. So he's still wearing pants. Oh, yeah. See, that, that creates a different image in my pants mind. Pants can't really go away. The, what about Donald Duck? <laughs> no pants! Shirt. I wouldn't say it. The girl had to be brought to him. No, you... do it scary. Oh, well. It's a girl voice. I'm not going to be doing a girl voice. Come on. Well, still. Owen said the girl had to be brought to him. You want her, you come and get her. Sophie scanned the narrow concrete staircase less than two yards wide. Ah, uh, meters. Ah, there you go. Bitch. Bitch. Bitch, you bitch, you bitch. 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 Bye. Bitch. Hey, you bloody bitch. You're just playing. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. One of these is going to be bitch perfect. A police marksman's bullet ended it. Sophie quick shifted through the gears. The light of the city streaked across lights. the... The lights of the city streaked across the windscreen as they sped across the Thames. Thames. Damnation. Windscreen and Thames. What? Sir, windshield. What kind of language is this? This is certainly not English. I know we invented the windshield. This is a long file for one word. Bitch. It's okay. All the alcohol is burned out of the meat if you cook it thoroughly. The end. I like to eat your liver with some fava beans and a nice key ante. Are you embarrassed easily? <laughs> Today's episode was produced. Oh, let me pop over to that real quick. Pop these. I'll pop you. You'll see. Oh. Uh, what's the male one? The penis. <laughs> penis mightier. It looks like my lucky day. I'll take the rapists for 400. The chick that did the voice of Sophie was really good. Oh, Sophie is the wear Sophie's the wear cat, wear uh, hey, panther, can whatever. Can we do the uh, the second Sophie story as well, do you think? I'm sure it's got to be published on the whatever it is first, Graveyard though. Graveyard sex. <laughs> Graveyard sex axe. Wait, what the hell? This is going to be all bloopers, folks. <laughs> We're going to release an episode that's just bloopers one of them. <laughs> Unless you donate. 